What if I told you there's a country um, whose genetic code is barely changed in maybe 4,000 years? It sounds pretty wild, right? But we're talking about Lithuania. Today, we're doing a deep dive into this very place. Researchers are saying its genetic makeup is like one of the most preserved in all of Europe. And what's really amazing is it's not just the biology. It's uh, the culture and the language, too. So our mission here for you is to unpack this story. How did Lithuanians manage to hold on to something so ancient, so unique, while, you know, wars and invasions were constantly reshaping the rest of Europe? Think of this as your shortcut to getting this incredible genetic story. It really is remarkable. And that preservation makes Lithuania, well, essentially a genetic time capsule. It gives scientists this unique snapshot of ancient Northern and Eastern Europe. It provides these um, crucial pieces that challenge some older ideas, like about how farming spread, showing these pockets where pre-farming populations really held on. A genetic time machine. <laughs> quite a concept. So what does that actually mean in practice? What are the key findings that make Lithuania so different? Well, scientists, particularly at the Estonian Biocenter and also looking at various genomic studies across the Baltics, they've found some really compelling stuff. For instance, something like over 60 percent of modern Lithuanian men share a specific Y DNA marker. It's a haplogroup called R1A. And this R1A, it's strongly linked with those big Indo-European migrations across Europe. But and here's the really interesting part. Lithuania also shows one of the highest levels of genetic continuity with uh, ancient Eastern European hunter-gatherers, specifically the people from the Eastern Baltic Neolithic period. Hmm, continuity with hunter-gatherers. So that sounds like they have less influence from those later, bigger migrations that changed much of Europe. Exactly. That's precisely it. Lithuanians carry noticeably less genetic mixing, or admixture, as we call it, from those major waves. You know, the ones that brought farming from the Middle East and herding cultures from the Eurasian steppes. Those two movements fundamentally changed the gene pool across most of Europe, but less so in Lithuania. That's why researchers talk about preserving a pre-farming Europe genetic signature. It means Lithuanians genuinely offer this unique um, window into ancient northern and eastern Europe. It shows us what the continent's genes look like before agriculture really took hold everywhere else. It's a view we just don't get in most other places. Okay, that genetic picture is fascinating. But what I found maybe even more intriguing is how this connects, or maybe doesn't quite connect, with the language. There's a bit of a twist there, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. I read that Lithuanian is linguistically unique, too. It's seen as, what, the most archaic living Indo-European language, closer to ancient Sanskrit than, say, French or German. Can you break that down a bit? What makes the language itself so special? Yeah, linguists are just fascinated by it. Lithuanian has kept features that have mostly disappeared elsewhere in Europe, things like uh, seven distinct noun cases, plus a very flexible word order and lots and lots of root words that trace directly back to Proto-Indo-European. Proto-Indo-European, that's the uh, theoretical ancestor language. Exactly. The common ancestor of languages from Hindi and Persian to English and Spanish. And because Lithuanian retains so many of these ancient features, it's naturally led to claims that maybe Lithuanians are, quote, Europe's oldest Indo-Europeans. Right. The language seems incredibly old, strikingly see, close to something like Sanskrit. So you can see why people might jump to that conclusion, oldest Indo-Europeans. Mm. But then the genetics throw a wrench in the works, don't they? They absolutely do. It complicates that narrative significantly. The genes don't fully back up that specific oldest Indo-Europeans claim, at least not in the simple way you might think. See, Lithuanians don't show exclusive ancestry from the Indo-European steppe populations, not like you might find in some Central Asian groups or even some Slavic populations. In fact, like we said, their genetic roots go back even older, connecting more strongly to those indigenous Baltic hunter-gatherers. So the language is Indo-European, super old, but the dominant genetic signature is pre-Indo-European. Kind of, yeah. It raises this really big question, a classic debate in historical linguistics and archaeology. Did the Indo-European language arrive in the Baltics mainly through conquest with new people replacing the old? Or was it more through um, cultural transmission? Did the existing hunter-gatherer descendants just adopt the new language? It really opens up a heated discussion about how history and culture actually work. It shows it's way more complex than just, you know, genes language, people. That really drives home how tangled human history is. It's not neat lines on a chart, is it? It's this messy mix of migration, adoption, cultural shifts, and that kind of complexity, especially when you tie it to genetics, must have some serious societal ripple effects, particularly when identity gets wrapped up in DNA. 
I mean, what happens when national identity gets linked so strongly to these kinds of genetic findings? It's a very real issue and often a challenging one. You saw this especially after Lithuania regained independence in 1990. There was this surge of interest in genetics and national origins. And the intention for many was genuinely about cultural preservation, about rediscovering and affirming a unique national identity after, you know, decades under Soviet rule. Which is understandable, but I gather this surge wasn't always straightforward. Critics raise concerns, arguing it's sometimes tipped over into something called genetic essentialism. Could you maybe explain that idea, genetic essentialism, and touch on some of the specific controversies that came up? Sure. Genetic essentialism is basically the belief, a pretty controversial one, that a group's identity, their culture, maybe even their personality traits are rigidly fixed or determined just by their genes. In Lithuania, some concerns arose around things like um, academic discussions, promoting ideas of pure bloodlines. Some critics felt this echoed, well, dangerous ideologies from the 20th century. There was also the politicization of genetic data. Sometimes it was used, perhaps unintentionally or sometimes pointedly, in ways that seemed to draw sharp distinctions between ethnic Lithuanians and, say, Slavic or Jewish minorities living there. And unfortunately, you also hear accusations that ancestry DNA past results get sort of cherry-picked and used in public debates about who counts as a true Lithuanian, mm. often in ways that are meant to exclude people. Mm. It's a really potent reminder that the science itself, the genetic data, is neutral. But how people interpret it, how it gets used in society, uh -huh. that can definitely be shaped by political agendas or nationalist feelings. That's such an important distinction. Science provides data, but meaning is constructed. It's easy to leap to conclusions about what genes mean for behavior or identity, isn't it? So keeping that crucial disclaimer firmly in mind that genes don't directly dictate personality or culture, what do some studies suggest about potential links between Lithuanian genetics and certain traits or characteristics? Cautiously, of course. Right. Caution is key here. We're talking statistical correlations, not destiny. However, some studies do suggest higher frequencies in the Lithuanian population of certain genetic variants or alleles. Some of these are linked with things like adaptation to colder climates. For example, genes involved in vitamin D regulation, which makes sense in regions with less sunlight. There are also some potential links suggested with genes related to um, maybe mental resilience. Again, you could argue that makes sense for surviving long, harsh winters or periods of historical isolation. Now, there are also more debated correlations that some studies have proposed, things like tendencies towards introversion or stoicism or maybe being more risk averse. But I have to stress, this is really debated territory. It's not universally accepted science. And these traits certainly aren't exclusive to Lithuanians by any means. Still, it's interesting how it seems to touch on that cultural stereotype, you know, the idea you sometimes hear of Lithuanians being stone-faced but soft-hearted. Mm. It makes you wonder about epigenetics, doesn't it? That whole fascinating field, looking at how our environment can actually flip gene switches on or off without changing the DNA sequence itself. Could that play a role in how any potential genetic predispositions actually get expressed? That's a fantastic point. Epigenetics adds another whole layer of complexity. It's entirely possible that cultural practices, historical experiences, diet, stress, all these things could interact with the underlying genetics through epigenetic mechanisms. It's an active area of research. OK, let's zoom out a bit then. This isn't just a story contained within Lithuania's borders, is it? Mm -hmm. What's the bigger picture? Why does this unique genetic profile matter on a global scale? Oh, it matters hugely for research worldwide. The Lithuanian genome is incredibly valuable. Scientists are using it to help reconstruct those complex Indo-European migration patterns we talked about. It gives a baseline, a kind of anchor point. It's also providing really unique data for understanding resistance or susceptibility to certain modern diseases. Sometimes ancient genetic profiles hold clues. And it helps trace early European population dynamics in general. It's a crucial piece of the puzzle for understanding how Europe was populated. And it's not just historical research, right? I heard Lithuanian data is even being used in some really cutting edge applications like AI driven medicine, yeah. helping develop personalized treatments. That's right. Because these markers are so well preserved, they can offer insights for developing treatments tailored to specific ancestral backgrounds. The potential for medical breakthroughs is definitely there. But, and this is a big but, it also brings up significant ethical challenges for Lithuania. They're grappling with how to balance supporting this potentially life-saving medical innovation with protecting the genetic privacy of their citizens, especially when, you know, international biotech companies are involved in collecting and using the data. It's a complex, tightrope walk data governance, individual rights versus collective benefit. It's a challenge many countries face, but maybe it feels particularly sharp here because the genetic heritage is so unique. 
Absolutely. So let's circle back to the core question we started with. Why is Lithuania's genetic story so special? I guess what we've learned is that it tells us something profound, that even on a continent defined by constant movement and mixing, one population managed to hold on to an incredibly ancient memory, not just in their genes, but in their language, and maybe even woven into their cultural spirit. I think that captures it perfectly. Lithuanians aren't just, you know, another piece of the European puzzle. They represent a living connection, a living chapter, reaching back to some of the continent's deepest roots. It offers these profound insights into Europe's past and really into the broader human journey. Which leaves us with a final thought, maybe something for you, the listener, to ponder. Does having such a preserved genome make a people inherently more ancient or perhaps just less mixed? Is there a difference? A fascinating question. Definitely something to think about. We hope this deep drive gives you a new lens for understanding history, identity, and maybe the incredible power of DNA, not just as biology, but as storytelling written right into ourselves.